Praise the Lord. Let's open our Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 as we slowly move through, through this book. And the, the, the reason is primarily he deals with so many different topics and deals with them within a few verses in this case tonight. Just one verse, verse 8. Solomon is, has come to a place of evaluation in his life. And we've been seeing that just in the past seven verses where he's evaluating different things that he wasn't in consideration of prior. He's an older man now. He's an older man now. And he's, he's grown through a phase of just being wild when he writes like Song of Solomon. And then the book of Proverbs comes in that mid age time of his life. And then Ecclesiastes is likely the last last writing he will do. And he's, he's in consideration. He's in consideration on various things in life. And at the end of the book, chapter 12, last two verses, he's going to come to this God resolve, that everything is going to be resolved in God and everything in fearing him and keeping his commandments. He comes to that there at the last two verses of the, of the book. But before he does that, he takes us through these times of of just consideration of things. So tonight we, we consider how, how it is when we get caught up into vain labor, when we get caught up into things that are not going to apply to any eternal value. We're going to look at that. He brings it up in verse 8. Look what he says here. All things are full of labor. Man cannot express it. He says, the eyes or the eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for this book, the Bible. And thank you, Lord, we can draw from it and draw from you because it's your word, Lord. So Holy Spirit, be the teacher. Show us, Lord, how to, to be in and good wisdom on things that we apply, things that we work at. Help us, like you, Jesus, work the works of God. So we thank you and we praise you. Speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It's something to remember, and we need to remember every time we approach this book, because Solomon's talking in, in, in a very <laughs> clear attitude of, of disgust, an attitude of, of realizing, we saw that in the first couple of verse, or verse two, where he says everything is vanity, vanity is all, and, and that kind of thing. He, he's coming to this place to where he's unloading, he's venting. And in his venting, it'd be easy to think that he's not considering God. That's not the case. I already mentioned the fact that he brings up God in a great way there at the end of the book. But in his consideration, we come to this thing to remember that life, life will always be empty without God applied to it. That's what Solomon will come to the understanding, the realization of, that, that life without God is vain. It's vain. Vain labor. Vain labor described as something that's done in vain labor or labor done in vain would, first of all, be things, primarily, first of all, things done without God's direction. Things done without God, God's direction. Also, things that are done without God's approval approval so that we don't have his direction nor his approval nor his sense of endorsement on it his leaning on it also things that are done for our own glory there are things that will cause us to work toward things and it's pretty much for our own own good we just we pretty much just think about us that can be vainglory also lastly things that are of sin things that are just sinful things that don't they don't have God's approval, and it's something that God would say is not appropriate, not good, would be sin. Now, we're not talking about here that, that this is things that, like, going to our job. We got to work, and we got to move in life. But there has to be a condition. There has to be a striking of the balance when it comes to understand that what I put time into something, what I put effort into something, what I put work into something, 
I, I want to be able to say, and you want to be able to say like Moses, Lord, establish the works of my hands. Moses knew, as Solomon has discovered, without God, it's vain. Without, without God, it, it, it's not going to reap again any eternal value. Isaiah 49, verse 4. Isaiah 49, verse 4. Isaiah comes to here late, late in this book, late in his life, he comes to this conclusion. And, and for a lot of times, Solomon's older when it comes to his understanding. So, and, he, and he says in verse 4 of Isaiah 49, then I said, then I responded, and it took him a time to get to this place of response. Look what he says here. Then I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength in nothing and in vain. Yet surely, he says here, my just reward is with the Lord and my work with my God. Isaiah comes to a great understanding, just totally right on with what Solomon's dealing with, is understanding that he realizes that things that he does that is in vain, he doesn't tell us what they are. There are things that he's labored in. It's been in vain. He spent his strength for nothing and in vain. So there was just that work at it. He was working at something. Yet surely, he has this hope, yet surely what he's done for God, he will get a just reward from the Lord. And my work he says here, with my God. And and that's the place we want to come to. We want to come to this resolve like Isaiah comes to. A resolve of being able to understand that things that I do, things that we do for God, to the glory of God, in the name of God, are going to be things that are going to be rewarded. They're going to be things going to be rewarded, things that God is going to, to give treasures to. And what a blessing to know that. Jesus on this on the work of God. It's in John 4, verse 34. You can see it on the screen. Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. And then look what he says at the end. And to finish his work. Jesus's focus, Jesus's total passion was on, first of all, doing the will of him who sent me. He recognized that he was submitted under the Father, being fully man, yet still being fully God. But we know in Philippians, he, he, he was obedient. And he submitted to the Father, even though he's God. Jesus is God. And he submitted to, it says here, the will, of, the will of him who sent me. And he says here, here's his other, his other passion is that, or along with it, is, is to finish, to complete, to complete his work, his work, the work that he's given. So point being in priority, you and I should be like Jesus. We should be, he's our example. And he gives us the example of fully committing to why he was sent here for him, being sent here from heaven, but also finishing the work of God, of the father who sent him, who sent him. Joel's message Sunday morning talking about serving God and the obstacles that get in the way of serving the Lord. What a good message. What a timely message. It goes along with this here, too. Because they, they, there is a reason that you and I, you and I were, were made. And it's to the God's glory, that is. It works to the good. It works in, okay, and, and to move in that purpose, to move in that plan, to move in that providence that God has for your life is where the joy is going to come from. It's where the security in life will come from. It's where even the, what, what makes life meaning comes from when you and I do what God's called us to do. And every Christian, not just the missionary in Africa or not just the preacher on Sunday morning, but every, every Christian ought to know what is the work that they're to finish. What is the work that we're to be doing? And Solomon now evaluates that in verse 8, how, how, he, how easily we, him and we, can get caught up in vain labor. Where I get caught up in doing something that, that is not going to yield 
we, we pray often in our prayer time with the worship team and in the prayer room that we're thankful that God gives us opportunities, privileges, and responsibilities taken to do eternal stuff. Eternal stuff. Once a person steps out into the parking lot here and serves in whatever way they serve, from passing out bulletins to making, setting up the donuts or teaching in the children's ministry or youth group, whatever it is, flipping PowerPoint slides, doesn't matter. It's eternal. It's, it's work of God. And God's going to show his appreciation, just like Isaiah said. Jesus would make it clear, too. There's going to be a just reward. Just reward is with the Lord, Isaiah said. And you and I have that just reward in God's grace and favor. Let's look at verse 8 of Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and look at this caught up in vain glory. The first line he says there in verse 1 is all things, all things. We talked about it before. Psalm is very dramatic and very expressive. And and it almost gives the impression when he says all things that anything we do that we work at is going to be just full of labor. But he's not saying that. All things without God. He said all things and he says here, are complete or full of labor. That word labor, we talked about it before. It means toil. It means a, a weariness. It means personally just something worked at. Worked at. Something putting effort and work in. We saw that in Isaiah just a few minutes ago. That putting that strength into something. So he says here that, that all the things that are worked at without God, they are full of weariness. The weariness gives the impression, or this impression is to give here in the understanding of the language, is that this weariness is something that is just never resolving, never completing. It's just always going, you're just always doing this thing. And whatever that thing may be, we get weary in it. And again, the fact is, you know, we got to work our jobs. That may be weary to us. And we got to move in life. We have to literally, physically move in life. But, but we need to be able to let God help us check, help us check when I'm putting time and effort and strength into something that doesn't have his condoning, doesn't have his approval. And I need to evaluate that. I need to evaluate that. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, you know it by heart probably. Jesus gave the invitation, come to me. Come to me, two types of people. All you who labor, which is like what Solomon's talking about, but also those who are heavy laden, you, you're carrying something. Your book pack, book pack is heavy. It's heavy. He says, come to me, and he says here, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest. No, no problem with seeing Jesus symbolically talking about the, the eternal salvation rest that we have. Oh, yeah, that, that can be in there. That's no doubt. But but he's also talking about things that you and I get caught up into. Man, he, he wasn't talking about salvation when he was dealing with Martha and her overworking. And Mary's at his feet and Martha's upset and tells Jesus, will you tell Mary to come and help me with these dishes? Come and tell, tell her. And Jesus says, he says to her, Martha, you are troubled by many things. That's amazing. You are heavy laden. You have a lot of stuff you're carrying. And it's not stuff that God gave you. It's stuff that we, we take ourselves. Jesus says that his, his yoke is easy. His yoke, like they put on a beast of burden. You're plowing a field, you put a yoke. And that yoke is designed to drive that beast and turn that beast. And it's, it's, a, it's a yoke. He says, I got a yoke too. It ain't like that yoke that you and I put on ourselves. It's a yoke that is easy. It's a burden that is light. And you and I need to be able to, and we need God's help to do it, be able to determine and realize, like Martha had to to realize by Jesus, letting the Lord show us that maybe we're troubled, maybe we're laboring and troubled by many things. And she literally was laboring. And missed the very fact. And he tells us Mary has found the best. 
Mary has found the best part. And he said this, and it won't be taken away from her. But, but in our labor, literal labor like Martha, you and I miss it. Jesus says, I want to give you rest. I want to give you rest in that. It's a full, he says here, it's full. Look at how he describes it there in verse 8. All things are full of labor, full of, full of weariness. And I got to determine those things that I need to give over to Jesus and you do too. And let him give us rest. Second thing he says there is concerning this labor. On the subject of this labor, he says there, man cannot express it. Express what? Express the labor. The word express there means he can't clarify it. He can't clarify it. It's not, he, he has no understanding. Man has no understanding why He's kind of doing that. It's just the way I do it. And there's there, there, and you just get caught. That's the whole point I'm talking about the sermon. Title sermon, or the title of the Bible study is caught up in vain labor. You get you and I get caught up in stuff, and there's no expressing it. There's no clarification. I, I don't need to clarify it. It's just what I do, and this is just how I do it. This is just how I, I'm going to work it out or work it through. And, and there's no, no sense of vision, no understanding why. In verse 7, excuse me, chapter 7 of Ecclesiastes, it's on the screen, verse 25, Solomon says this. And, and, and listen to this man and, and how complex this thing is about as far as life and understanding life. He says, I applied my heart to know. Oh, that's where he makes his first mistake. Because only God can reveal it to us. We, we do that first line all the time. I'm going, I got to understand this. I got to know this. I got to figure this thing out. And we'll stay up all night and be no good at work tomorrow because there was some kind of labor. There was some kind of put forth of something trying to deal with something. He says, he says I, I apply my heart, all my heart to know, to search, he says there. He says, to search and seek out wisdom and the reason of things. Oh, my God. This is why this man is confused. This is why you and I get confused. Because we, we set out to work at stuff that God has to work. Jesus has to get. He says there he, that he seeks and, excuse me, he searches and seeks out one thing, and that's wisdom. He should know. Let's believe, he, believe this is after Proverbs. He got wisdom from God. But you and I will vain labor and try to seek it out ourselves and look for wisdom. Look for what needs to be applied. Wisdom is applying the right thing. Then he says, and the reason of things and, and why things are, are as they are. Oh, that can be very dangerous in our lives. He says to know, he wants to know the wickedness of folly even the foolishness of madness. <laughs> this is one verse, verse 25. We'll come to it, Lord willing, Jesus tarries when we get this chapter 7. But man, it's a verse of just, of just how easy you and I can be caught up into trying to figure out stuff that should come from God's word, that should come from the Lord. But Solomon has this thing about wisdom. He gets it from God. That's why he writes Proverbs. Writes 31 chapters of Proverbs of wisdom. But, but he, also, he also has this struggle within him to try to attain something he can't attain. So going back to what he said in 1.8, he says, man cannot express it. He cannot. He can't clarify it. He can't clarify this, this drive to try to find out stuff. This working at something, and he doesn't see that. It's, it's in vain. In vain labor, three things about in vain labor. In vain labor, first of all, there is darkness in vain labor. In vain labor, there's darkness. There's, there's not the ability to really see what's happening. We, we continue to do something pretty much in the dark. And we, don't, and we don't even see that this thing isn't getting better. This thing isn't getting prosperous. This thing is not working out good. It is not having an end to it because it's in dark. We can't even see where we're moving. In vain labor also, there's deception. It's very deceptive. It, 
it kind of thinks that we can keep working at this. We can keep doing this. And there's going to be <clears throat> blessing or resolve or something to it. No, that, that comes from the Lord. That comes from the Lord. It, it, it is it is understanding that, that point that it's not only darkness, it's deception. Then vain labor, there's the devil. There's the devil. I believe the devil would like you and I to be distracted by putting time and effort and strength into something that's not going to come through, that's not going to glorify God. He'll keep us locked up there. And, and I think that is something that we need the Holy Spirit always helping us to examine us and helping us to do that. Because I will easily get into stuff thinking that this is really going to work out for the good. Or I apply something in my life. And, and, it, and, it, and there's no God in it at all. We talked about that earlier. So, but we think it's going gonna, it's gonna to work out. We think it's going to work out. I, I, I encouraged a guy one time who, and he shouldn't have told me if he didn't want my response, but he said, he said, I, I'm letting my kid play soccer because I wanna, want him to be, be taught how to socialize. <laughs> really? So you sit into soccer? Is this coach saved? No, I don't think so. <laughs> Do they pray at this thing? They go through the word? No. Man, that's not, that's vain. That's vain. Just say you're sending the soccer so you hope you get a scholarship for college one day. Don't use this thing about, like, sound like it's wisdom. Sound like, you know, oh, I, just, I just want to associate. I just want to have socialization skills. Man, you're teaching that at home. Teaching that the confines and boundaries of that in the Bible. I'm going to let somebody that doesn't even know the Lord do that or something that's not even designed about that. I think I, think I told you about a, we were at a soccer game. I heard the coach tell the team. He says, there's nothing more important than us winning this game today. Really? There ain't nothing more important than winning this game today? What about your salvation? What about doing the will of God and finishing the work of God? No. But see, that's what happens when we can get into this vain labor thing. It, it, Satan induces it. It's also deceptive. It's, there's deception, and it's dark. You can, um, you, we can ask ourselves, because we get caught up in this too, or we can ask somebody else. You can ask somebody, why, why are you doing that? Why is that happening? Whatever, whatever it may be. It's a, it's a reaction to something. And you keep reacting this way. You keep ending in this pit by doing this. You can ask a person, why, do, why is that repetitive in your life? Why do you do that? Why do you work it that way? And you know what I found out most of them will say? I don't know. They don't know. They don't see it. Because it cannot be expressed. Solomon says here. I just, I just do it that way. <laughs> the third thing he brings up here is two things he deals with, three and four as far as points. He deals with here, dealing with, first of all, the eye. Then he deals with the ear. He says here, the eye in this vain labor, in this labor that is full, the eye, he says here, is not satisfied with seeing, not satisfied with seeing. In, in vain labor, there is, there is a, a sense of, of, of possessions. It, it's building up stuff. Normally, it's, it's trying to get rich. It's trying to get something that you want monetarily, you know, pretty much. And, and it moves in this possession mode, and, 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 it's, and the eyes never... Never satisfy in what it can say. You've been to, you probably, if you hadn't been, you're blessed. You've probably been to one of those meetings where they had the pyramid scheme. And, you know, if you sell this, this guy gets money for it. And you get people under you, you can get money from them. And I just, you know, I, mean, I got invited to two of those. Oh, my gosh. I lost friends over that kind of stuff because there were Christian people inviting me to this stuff. And, and, and what it, what it, what it builds upon is you getting rich, you getting money. And, and we know, the Bible says, the love of money, the love of money, not money, 
Love of money is the root of all evil. Loving money, having this, this lust for money will cause evil to kind of move into our lives. So when we move in some kind of vain labor, the eyes are never satisfied. It'll never be enough. If you love money, you'll never have enough. You never, you, you always want more. You always want more. In vain, labor also is promotion. It, it, it's, it's always, it's never satisfied with where the person is. We know the Bible says, and, and Christians know, but we all, we all get caught into this sometimes, some of the time, time. We know the Bible says that promotion comes from the Lord. And we believe that. And we thank God when we get make chief. Or you praise God when you get a promotion at the job. And we should because promotion comes from the Lord. But you start, you, you and I start moving into stuff where we just feel we can just work this ourselves. I can just bring this about ourselves. It's like the Tower of Babel stuff, man. We can do this. We can build a tower and reach the heavens, man. And we can get up there. And you, and you got people in this sensible act to try to get promotion, trying to get higher. Also in vain labor is power. And there's that power. The vain labor of power. Um, power is something that you and I in our flesh just feeds upon. It, it, it's, it's, it's telling other people what to do and being satisfied. Psychiatrists call it codependent. When you ain't satisfied unless you're telling somebody else what to do. No, it's just the flesh. It's just the flesh. It's the flesh having this kind of oversight thing. I, I know where you need to go. And what you need to do. It's on the screen. Look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. It says this, for all that is in the world. What's in the world, John? Three things. He says there first, the lust of the flesh. That, he said this, this driving, this passion to let the flesh just have its way. It's the, it, whatever the flesh wants, whatever the lust of the flesh is, it, it, it's, it's allowed to do that. A, that's a life with no Boundaries, a life that has no, no barriers. It has no sense of judgment of what is good and best and right. He said the world is that. The world is also lust of the eyes. That's what we're talking about when the eyes are never satisfied. Lust of the eyes. That's not just talking about any kind of sexual kind of thing. It, it is talking about that. that. That can be included with it. But it's, it's broader than that. It's talking about, no, it's just what the eyes see. And, and it was that whole identification right there in the beginning of the Bible with Adam and Eve. They saw that the fruit was pleasing to the eye. The eye is amazing. Those eyes are a big deal, man. That's why Job would say, I made a covenant with my eyes. I made a covenant with my eyes. You, you and I have to let the Holy Spirit help us make a covenant with our eyes that, that we won't let what we see outside of God's will and plan and righteousness, we won't, we won't have an appeal for it. And then the last one he says of the three is the pride of life. Pride of life. Just moving in pride. It's moving in, in me being superior. He says these things are not of the Father, but of the world. The eyes. The eyes are not satisfied. The eyes always see more and, and will want more. The last one, and we're done. He says at the end of the verse here, nor the ears filled with hearing. Taking in statements, messages, affirmations, whatever they may be, hearing a praise, hearing a favor, hearing of even just gratitude that, that people just say, I'm just so glad you're in my life, you know, whatever. Or it may be this. We will work to hear people praise us. We'll work to hear people favor us. And we'll work to hear people show gratification or thank, thanksgiving for us. And that can be a, it can take us the wrong direction. <laughs> because God is the one that we should be praising. God is the one that we should show grace for. And also hearing gratitude. Um, the, the ears have to be conditioned by the Holy Spirit or, or I'll just be driven by just what they say, what they say about me. 
or what they don't say about me. I look for that. And we all can get caught in that. Solomon is saying that, that, that he, was, he was caught up in that. He was saying he was caught up in that. He was caught up in this vain, this vain glory, this vain sense of hearing who he is. And man, he had a lot. He had a lot. People walk into his palace and say, ooh, ah, wow, wee. And he was caught up in that. And a lot of that was coming his way. A lot of praise, a lot of favor, a lot of gratitude. Let's close by looking at Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. Colossians 3, verse 23 is, is our labor. We need to labor unto the Lord. Just like what Jesus said, we saw that. But in Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 and 24, we get the the right understanding concerning how we should do things. And he says it very plainly. Whatever you do, whatever you labor in, whatever you apply in life, first of all, do it heartily. Let it be something that's done with a right heart. Right heart. See that that's the way we check it to make sure we don't move in the vein labor is that I can put my heart in this particular thing rightly. He says, verse 22, they do it heartily, and there it is, and as to the Lord and not to man, is that our, our whole labor should be with the right heart, heartily, and to the Lord. And we have to check and make sure it's not to man. Knowing that, here it is again, knowing that from the Lord we will receive, there it is, the reward of the inheritance. For you serve the Lord Christ. He, he just, he just kind of homes it right into, okay, listen, what you're doing, who you're serving, you, you're doing it unto the Lord, knowing this, that there's going to be eternal reward for it. Let those be the priorities. Not to say you can't plant, you know, azaleas in your backyard. You know, we know those values ain't going to have nothing to do with the glory of God unless you, you give them away to people that can be that, be a witness. But my point is, you know what I'm saying, is not to get weird on this, but to be a, understand, let God strike the balance in this kind of thing. I want to make sure I'm doing something that's unto the Lord, not the man, not just doing it for eye service and man, and doing it in the recognition and, and reminding myself, us remind ourselves, is that we're going to receive a reward for those things we do in the Lord. Those things that we do outside the Lord, vain labor, ah, they don't reap anything. They don't reap anything. So letting the Holy Spirit check us, condition us, and yes, even convict us to make sure we're not doing stuff that's not at all what God wants. It, it, it is, I don't want to be wasting my time. And you don't either. You don't either. I want to be doing things that are going to contribute to the glory of God and, and, and boy, have the blessing of him rewarding us for those things. So let's be, let's be doing his work and finish his work like Jesus. To finish his work. Amen to that. Huh? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much, Lord, for this. Solomon just, boy, just reasoning, Lord, concerning things that he's been involved in, and now he's letting those things go. And he's recognized that these things, like vain labor, can't even be expressed. And he, he recognizes that the eyes are never satisfied when you start working for something for our own glory. And the ears, they're never satisfied either. They'll just keep on hearing. They want to hear affirmation from man. So teach us, Lord, not to, to live for the response of people, but live in response of you, Jesus. You're the Lord. You're the Christ. You're the one, Lord, that we want to surrender our lives to. So we thank you for this, this interesting book of Ecclesiastes, and we thank you, Lord, as we move through it. Guide us. Show us things we need to say. And always help us to let you be the resolve. You be the one 
that we come to knowing it's all about just fearing you and keeping your commandments. Help us to do that. Now, God, bless us where we go from here. Bless us, Lord, if we have to move into challenging days or times of confusion. Thank you that you are with us. So let your spirit, your presence, your glory lead us and take us through. And may we never forget, you're always with us. Wherever we go, wherever we are, you're there. Thank you for your love, for your mercy, grace, and for your awesome faithfulness. It's in Jesus' name we thank you. Amen. God bless your hearts. Have a good rest of the week. Let's stand.